Okay. All right, so let's quickly review what we did in the last class. Um, we finished up chapter two, okay? Specifically, we looked at some examples in chapter two. Chapter two is all about giving you some tools. Chapter three will also be adding um, to some of the tools that you already picked up in chapter two. But here we saw passive sign convention, then we looked at Kirchhoff's laws, and then Kirchhoff's voltage law, current law and voltage law. Okay, current law, Kirchhoff's current law is um, manifestation of the fact that um, there's conservation of charge, okay, of the fact that uh, the amount of current going in to any node, total amount of current going into a node is zero, okay. And then we looked at uh, examples of that problem. And then we also saw the idea of Kirchhoff's voltage law where you add all the different voltages around a mesh or around a loop. Okay, there can be a bunch of different loops in a circuit. If you add all the voltages around a loop very carefully, they're all going to come to a total sum of zero. Zero, right? So that's the idea of KVL. Professor? Yes. Are we supposed to be seeing a slide on the screen? My bad. Just give me one second. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here is this ritual. Um, I forget some steps. I don't forget some steps. Um, starting the cloud recording, starting the screen shading, turning my mic on. So um, thank you for letting me know. If I forget something like this. Maybe if I forget to record to the cloud, you keep an eye out and let me know or remind me to do that. Thank you for doing that. So here is the idea. We looked at uh, the three techniques. Let me go back. Passive sign convention, Kirchhoff's current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay. So we started looking at KCL and KVL and then problems related to that. Then specifically in the last class, we went over the idea of um, using KCL and KVL over circuits that have dependent current sources, okay? That have dependent current sources. Something like this, okay? Circuits that have dependent current sources. But the idea was same. Um, dependent current source is nothing but a, um, a current source or a voltage source. It could be current source or a voltage source that is not constant, but its value depends on some um, circuit variable. That doesn't matter, okay? The purpose of the idea of KCL and KVL applies here as well. And the general procedure is to do this. Set up arbitrary directions for current and voltage. I choose voltage and current directions. Okay, and then I identify the unknowns. And for the number of unknowns, I, uh, for all the nodes, I set up the KCL equation, Kirchhoff's current law equation. And then I judicially set up KVL equation only over loops that give me some breakout. Okay, in the sense that um, I'm very careful in choosing my KCL and KVL so as to give me, um, solution as soon as possible. And then uh, when I set up a bunch of equations, I solve for the unknowns. So that's the general procedure for KCL and KVL. Okay, questions about that, please. All right, so if you don't have questions, I'm going to ask Val to discuss the questions that she had. She had two questions, one about this circuit, and the other about these circuits. These were thoughtful questions, I tell you why. Um, because she already had the right answer when she answered the, um, asked me the question, but then she wanted to take a look back and make sense of them physically, get some insights into how physical circuits operate, not just arrive at the right answer. That's the kind of mindset you want to have. It's not, it's not good to move on when you have the right answer, but take a step back and, and analyze why it is right. Get some intuition 
about um, glean some insights from the answers and make some physical sense. All right. So Val, do you want to um, talk about the questions you had here? Sure. So um, my question was why currents I1 and I2 were running south. Because um, from a physical standpoint, I was kind of looking at the current and it's pointing down and I would have thought a little bit of current would have looped back across the resistors. Um, and Professor Rajuri explained to me that the KCL laws and the KVL laws, um, they both are self-correcting. So it kind of doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. You don't really have to worry about it. You, you can assign it and you'll get the correct answer in the end. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that's exactly true. KCL and KVL is self-correcting. The idea that you don't see, that's a very insightful question, isn't it? The current is going down south, IX. I1 also appears to be going south. I2 appears to be going south. Well, if all of these currents are coming in to join, like all the cars are coming in to meet at this particular node, well, they have to have some, some path to leave, right? Obviously, they're not leaving in this path um, because the current in this path is zero, okay? And then um, that that's the interesting question she had, and like she um, very correctly explained, the idea that I1 is going south, I2 is going south, and Ix is going south are all my assumptions, okay? I had no way of telling, I'm sorry, I had no way of telling before solving the problem whether I1 and I2 were going north or south. Okay, I did not know. So this is the general procedure. You remember step one to set up, well, step one was to set up currents and voltages. That's what I mean um, by setting up currents and voltages. I arbitrarily assume that I1 and I2 is going south. And Val mentioned it currently. I don't have to be correct about this assumption. I only have to make sure that I'm correct about applying KCL and KVL very carefully, correctly, accurately. Then um, I don't have to be 100% correct about the assumption about the direction of these currents. The final answer is going to, because it's a self-correcting um, process, it's going to hint that they're going actually in the opposite direction by throwing a negative sign in your answer there, okay? So when you solve using the KCL and KVL problem, carefully, the arbitrary direction that you chose does not matter. It does not matter and it does not um, affect the solution because KCL and KVL is self-correcting and it incorporates a negative sign wherever it has to correct for your assumptions, okay? That's a very insightful question. The question was, if all the currents are coming into this node, well, where are they leaving from, okay? Similarly, uh, thank you, Val. Uh, she also had another question about this car, right? Yeah, um, so... Do you want to look at this or do you want to look at that? Either one, I just, is it okay to talk about the homework problems? Yes. Okay. Yes. You don't have to give the solution, just give the intuition behind it because I think it's a valuable, um, valuable uh, insight. Okay. So they said um, they want to know what the power, um, I believe it was delivered uh, by the 20 volt uh, independent source. And I wasn't sure which current to sort of use, I guess, in the power formula. And it uh, turns out that you can use both and you get the same answer. And from a physical standpoint, I, I guess just looking at both currents opposing each other, it, it was kind of easy for my brain to go, well, maybe they cancel each other out. But 
that also doesn't make sense and Professor Maduri um, let me know that that's not the case. Yes, 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 that's correct. And um, do you, do you, uh, can you talk about why that's, uh, uh, the, so there are two currents. She actually identified um, two currents that seem to be opposing each other, okay? There is one current going up, this eight amperes current, and there seems to be another current, I delta, that is negative eight amperes, that seems to be going in the opposite direction. Her question was, well, if there is one current of eight amperes going up and there's another current of I delta going to the left, don't they cancel each other out? That was the nice question she had. And the correct answer is that they don't cancel out each other. There's only one um, current flowing here. Right? Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I think that you, you um, made a good point here. Um, not really, just that if you yeah. apply the passive sign convention, um, yes. that's where you can see that you do get the same answer regardless of the current that you're using. Thank you. Yeah, that's the good point. So um, when it pertains to looking at these two currents, I delta and eight amperes going up, okay, this eight amperes going up and this I delta going to the left, it, it would appear like there are two different currents, right? But there are not. There's only one current. There's exactly one current, okay? That's this eight amperes current that is actually going up. Well, what about this I delta then? Well, I delta is simply a variable. It's not a real physical current. If this is a variable that I assume just so it makes it easy for me to solve the problem. Okay, so it's a little like saying this current source, that's the one that sets the actual physical current going in the circuit. Okay, then we talked about a simile um, about saying, uh, let's say I owe you a million dollars. Okay, that's exactly the same as saying you owe me some money, you owe me actually negative one million dollars. Okay, so in terms of um, in terms of the idea, they're both the same, right? I owe you a million dollars is exactly the same as you owe me a negative million dollars. Well, if you look at these two statements in conjunction, well, it should not definitely mean that there are two different credit lines that cancel out each other, right? Well, there, are, there aren't. There's only one physical reality that I borrowed some money from you some time ago, some 500K. Some, um, some time ago, some five, 10 years ago. And now I, money has to flow from me to you in order to close that. But when it comes to account books, I could even... Um, show that you owe me some money, negative $1 million. That's exactly this I delta, okay? The physical reality is that the current is going up and I delta is just a variable. Um, that's an equivalent statement, okay? It's not a real current. It's a variable that I use to solve for currents, okay? And that's the reason why when you solve it, you get a value of negative eight amperes for I delta. Okay, and she was careful, extremely careful not to give out a whole lot of information on the homework problem. Um, and I appreciate um, her using that judgment uh, over there. Thanks, Val. Sure. Okay, other questions, please. What other questions do you have? Okay. So let's continue from there. That's chapter two, passive sign convention, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. That's the idea of passive sign convention. So let's start with chapter three, okay? Chapter three, a new interesting topic. It's a very simple chapter actually. I'm pretty sure you picked up some of these topics in, uh, in, in your physics um, course as well. Okay, simple resistive circuits. See this? 
or parallel. Series and parallel combination. That's all there is to this. So um, I hope to be able to finish this um, chapter in a reasonably small amount of time without belaboring the point too much because it's an easy concept, fun concept, but it's a very, very useful technique. So far we looked at passive sign convention. then KCL, then KVL, and then of course series and parallel simplification. Okay, so this corresponds to resistive circuits, but the same concepts, similar concepts apply to capacitive and inductive circuits as well. And we'll look at that at a later point in time. Okay, so let's have it. Now, there are some points that you want to remember when it comes to series and parallel circuits. And I don't care if you get it tattooed on your hands, etched on your forehead, I don't know. Um, the important thing is that you want to remember forever the fact that when you see um, a series connection, the definition of series connection is that the same current flows through each of the devices, okay? And similarly, when you see a parallel connection, when you see a parallel connection, same voltage is applied or appears across all the, same voltage applies across all the devices as well. So that's true for parallel. Okay, uh, that's, that's what we are going to look at. So first let's look at the series connection here. So this is called a series connection. And the way to identify a series connection is that if you look at this resistance R1 and the resistance R2, they're connected at one end, okay? And the current that is coming in to R1 has nowhere else to go but into R2, so the current, so think of this as a road, okay? And think of R2 as another road. If all the cars that are coming in from west to east, all the eastbound cars in this R1 road have nowhere else to go but to R2, okay? Then this is the idea of series connection. Okay, then that you can think of the number of cars as being similar to the current. Okay, number of cars is the current. So um, the current that is going in one road has nowhere else to go but to go into R2. That's the idea of series connection. The exact same thing is happening for R3 as well. All the current coming in from R2 through to R2 has nowhere else but to go through R3. And then eventually go into R4 and um, loop back around, okay? So that's the idea of a series connection, okay? Series connection, the quick way to see is that at any node, at this node, there is only one path that is um, leading in and one path that is leading out. And then R1 and R2, therefore, are in a series connection. Okay, so that's that's um, the idea. Okay, and then um, each element connects to the neighbor at only one um, point. Okay, each element connects to the neighbor at only one uh, neighbor. Okay, so if you do the KVL, if you look at the KVL around the loop, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing this. If you do a KVL around the loop, let's show, let me show you the loop here. Okay. You will see that by following the um, clockwise pattern from lower left corner, the V source plus the sum of all the voltages dropped in the seven resistance 
that should sum to zero. Okay, when you do that, and when you plug in, account for the fact that all the different columns in the branches, are in the different resistances are exactly the same, the result that you get here is that the overall voltage drop is IS times the total equivalent resistance. Or in other words, if I rearrange this, the idea that you will get is, if you have a bunch of resistors connected in series, okay, the equivalent resistance is the sum of all the individual resistances. So in other words, the argument I am making is that this circuit on the top is exactly same for all intents and purposes, especially at this node, okay? At the nodes A and H, at nodes A and H. From those terminals perspective, the circuit on the top and the one on the bottom are exactly the same, okay? They're identical equivalent, okay? The resistance equivalent of a series combination of a bunch of resistances is the sum of all the individual resistances. Okay, this applies to any number of resistances. Okay, let's see. Okay, that's exactly what I have here. When I have a bunch of resistances connected in series, that behaves exactly same as a circuit with one large resistance, R equivalent, whose value is sum of R1 through R7, okay? So that's a concept that you're already familiar with, okay? Simple concept. Now there are some quick sanity checks that you can use to verify your solution. Let's say I have one kilo ohm here, five kilo ohm here, and 20 kilo ohms here, okay? And you get an answer that's around, I don't know, um, 15 kilo ohms for R equivalent, okay? Well, you don't even have to do the math. You simply look at your solution and know that this is a wrong answer because the overall equivalent resistance in a series circuit should be greater than the largest of the resistances here, okay? So you don't even know what the other resistances are, R5, R6, but just by observation, you know that the total equivalent resistance in a series circuit should definitely be greater than the greatest of the um, resistances here. Okay, so that's a quick sanity check that you can use to um, validate the accuracy of the final solution. Okay, quick and dirty but functional approach. So here is the principle, the equivalent resistance of a set of series resistances, well, that is always, always larger than the largest single resistance. Okay, that's a quick sanity check that you can use. Similarly, let's see if we can, um, if we can um, do the idea of parallel connection. Okay, so series connection is when one circuit component, one element or component directly leads into just one more. One circuit component directly feeds into just one more um, resistance and and uh, no more paths. Okay, think of this as one road leading into just another road. Okay, there is no other diversions here. That's not there. Okay, so that's the idea of series connections. When it comes to parallel connections, the idea is a little different. Okay, here you have, here you have four parallel resistances or four parallel paths. So if you think of this, um, going back to the analogy of uh, traffic, if you think of the 
number of, and if you think of a number of cars coming in through this path, well, they have four parallel roads to branch out into before they loop back in and join again. Okay, so this is the characteristic of um, parallel paths. These four resistances diverge from a common node, okay? And then they converge back to another common node, okay? So in other words, between two nodes, between two intersections, let's say there is one road, a big road, big horn boulevard, I don't know. Okay, and then there are four parallel paths here, four roads, okay? I'm not the world's best artist, so forgive me for that. So this is, okay. So there is a path, one, two, um, let's, let's just stick with three paths. Okay, there are three different paths here. There's a pathway that leaves the road and merges again. Similarly, there's another pathway that leaves and merges the same road, okay? This kind of path, okay, is the idea of a parallel um, connection. Okay, in a parallel connection, components branch off from the exact same node. They branch off from the same node. So there's R1, R2, R3, and R4 branching off from there. And then they merge back um, to another common node, branching off of a common node and merging back into a common node. That's the idea of, um, that's the idea of parallel connections. And I'm saying this over and over again because I really want to drive home this notion of parallel resistances being similar to parallel paths or parallel roads, okay? If they think of this, if there are a whole lot of um, stop signals in this path and there's a whole lot of um, speed bumps in this path, so let me do this. Let me show them using red color. Okay, there's a lot of uh, speed bumps. There are a lot of um, stop signs along those paths. And let's say um, there's absolutely, there's a, this guy R2 is a freeway. Okay, there's no, um, there's no stoplight or there's no uh, speed bumps over there. And R4 is another expressway. R4 is an expressway as well. So for the number of, cars that are trying to get from point A to point B, okay? Or point B to point A rather. Let's say I have um, a lot of cars, 100 cars, trying to get from point A to point B. Of the resistances R1, R2, R3, and R4, which one do you expect to have a lot of cars? And which paths do you expect to have fewer paths? fewer cars. Which of these paths has higher traffic and which of these paths has lower traffic? Would it be the resistor closer to the end has less traffic? Sure, that's one way to think about it. But uh, think, go back to the idea of, uh, idea of um, traffic. Like, like I mentioned, the ones R1 and R3 are large, and that is similar to a resistance, a large resistance. You can think of it as being similar to a road that has a lot of speed bumps, a lot of um, stop signs, and not very, not very uh, traffic friendly. Okay, on the other hand, R2 and R3 I'm sorry, R2 and R4 have very less resistance, small resistance. Similar to they being, uh, similar to the fact that they're, um, they're, uh, they don't have many stop signs, they're expressway basically. 
So which of these paths um, has more traffic? Well, clearly R2 and R4 has more traffic because it's a freeway. Um, there's a free flow of, uh, barring any accidents, um, there's a free flow of traffic over here. There is very little traffic through R1 and R3 because these roads are crappy. These roads are not, um, there's a whole lot of stop signs. There's um, pedestrian traffic, um, a whole lot of nuisance. Over, uh, nuisance in the sense, um, um, in the sense there's a lot of difficulty for um, driving that road. So the idea I'm trying to drive home is in a parallel path, different resistances carry different currents just like four parallel roads have different traffic based on the um, road quality and and um, other considerations okay so that's the idea i'm trying to um, drive home and therefore the current remember i gave you this simile that uh, number of cars or the traffic in a particular road is very similar to the current. Okay, similar to the current. That's what I mentioned in the um, in the previous exam. Okay, so what you want to see is that um, what you want to see is that this guy. Um, uh, different parallel paths have different currents, except the voltage across all of these resistances is exactly the same. The voltage across these resistances, the voltage across all parallel paths in a resistance is the same. The currents are different, okay? So that's the idea of parallel paths. When we look at some problems, we'll understand. Well, what is the equivalent resistances? When you have four resistances in parallel, R1, R2, R3, R4, the equivalent resistance, or in other words, the resistance that can, without any problem, replace all the four resistances here uh, without any change in the terminal behavior is this guy, R equivalent, okay? So the equivalent resistance, the R equivalent is equals to the reciprocal okay r equivalent is equals to the reciprocal of the different resistances here okay and you can do that from kcl by applying kcl okay the total current coming in is the current that's branching out the total current coming in is is and the total current branching out through these different branches is i1 I2, I3, and I4, okay? So that's the idea of um, applying KCL. And the big picture is the big picture, uh, big um, take home point from this is that the equivalent resistance of parallel resistances is the reciprocal of some of the reciprocals, okay? So if I were to, if I were to, do a quick sanity check again, like this uh, sanity check similar to the one I pro, uh, mentioned earlier for, uh, for series combination. The quick sanity check here is the series or the parallel, the equivalent resistance, R equivalent, R equivalent in parallel, is smaller than the smallest. The R equivalent is parallel is smaller than the smallest resistance. Okay, so that's the idea of, uh, that's the idea of uh, a parallel connection. So in other words, if I have a bunch of resistance, 13.35, okay, 18.961, Okay, 1.732, 3.14 ohms, okay? Something like this. If I have a bunch of different resistances, 
that are not really they don't have a whole lot of intuitive um, intuitive point here except um, and you are asked to find out the R equivalent you carefully do this the R equivalent I know for a fact that in order to find R equivalent 1 over R equivalent equals to the sum of the reciprocals okay plus 1.13.35 plus 1 over 1 18.96 18.96 plus 1 over 1.732 okay and you did this you plug this into your calculator and you got some number i don't know um 2.879 ohms for r equivalent okay well, can you tell me if it is right or not well i don't even have to do the math i don't need to plug in the numbers i can look at this right away and tell you that this answer is not correct. This is wrong. Okay. How do I know that? Because I apply a quick sanity check. When I look at all the resistances in the parallel path, what's the smallest resistance? 1.732. Okay. Well, is my equivalent resistance smaller than that? No. Then I obviously must have made some mistake, some error somewhere. Okay. So that's the idea of. Um, So that's the idea of uh, um, quick sanity check. Okay, the um, advantage of sanity check is that um, you can take a step back, um, not worry too much about the calculations, and then look at the big picture and see if you're right or wrong. That's the reality check or the sanity check. The idea is the equivalent resistance in parallel that's always smaller than the smallest resistance, okay? So that's the idea of uh, resistances in parallel. Resistances in parallel. Okay, let's see what else we can do. Okay, and then um, I'll give you some um, expressions for quick, um, for quick math when you're doing two resistances. When you have two resistances, R1, and R2 in parallel, the equivalent resistance R equivalent. If you apply the formula, you're going to see that it's one over R1 plus one over R2. And then if you solve for R equivalent, you're going to see that R equivalent is the product of the resistances by the sum of the resistances. Okay, so that's the notion of, that's the idea of um, that's the idea of resistances in parallel. Two resistances in parallel. Okay. So let's uh, reiterate the idea of traffic and currents using this guy. Okay. So let me reiterate the notion. Let's say I have some current going in to these two nodes. Okay. I want to say there is some current. 10 amperes of current going in to this um, node here, okay? What happens if these resistances are equal? Okay, if these resistances are equal, then the current is going to split equally between these two paths, okay? Similar to saying there is a total of 100 cars coming in, and one path has um, as much difficulty as the other path, okay? So then the likelihood is that there's an equal distribution of, there's an equal distribution of cars because both of these paths, paths are exactly the same. Both of these roads are exactly the same. But imagine one of these paths, so that's the idea that the current is divided in terms of the, um, resistance of the opposite path. So let's say um, in one of these paths, there's a pretty bad accident and the traffic is slowing down, okay? Then, so in other words, then what happens is if this resistance is really large 
and R1 is small. Okay, similar to one road having an accident, the road R2 having an accident and um, a congestion, and R1 having a free flow of traffic. Then you would expect a whole lot of current or a whole lot of traffic to take road R1 and very few traffic um, drivers choosing road R2. So that's the idea of current division, okay? A large resistance carries a small current and a small resistance carries a large current when they're in parallel. Does that make sense? A large resistance carries a small current and a small resistance carries a large current when they're connected in parallel. So I got a question for you. How about in series? Let's say I have two resistances, R1, R2, and R3. So one is R1, R2 is really large, and R3 is extremely large. They're connected in series. What do you think happens to the current um, in each of these resistances? Does it get weaker? Does it get bigger? I don't know. They're in series. Remember? Oh, oh no, I, I'm sorry. Um, I said, does it get weaker? Does it get weaker? Think about it. It's the same. The current that is coming in here has nowhere else to go but through this. So what's the definition of resistance current in series? It stays the same, it's constant. Same, thank you, it's the exact same current. The current coming in, so the voltages across these resistance will certainly be different, okay? But the current in a series is exactly the same, okay? But think about this resistance um, in parallel. Well, the voltage across both of these resistances is exactly the same. They don't have two different voltages, but what is happening here, the current is dividing based on which one is large and which one is small, okay? So that's, make sure that you understand the, the difference between current division in parallel and current staying the same in series, okay? Questions? Okay. So there's a problem here. We can do a quick problem. Solve for the currents IS, I1, and I2. So the IS is the current flowing in that guy. West eastbound current in resistance, four ohm resistance. I1 is the southbound current in the 18 ohm resistance. And I2 is the southbound current in six ohm resistance. Well, that's, why is it that I'm not interested in the current in this guy? Because it's the same um, as going through the six ohm resistor. So if you know the current. current. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, if you know the current through the six ohm resistor, then you know the current through the three ohm resistor. Thank you, that's correct. That's exactly um, the reason why, because three and six ohm resistances are in series, okay? So the idea is to solve for these currents, I1, I2, and I3, and this is what I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is to notice that these two resistances are in series, so I can simply add those values to get the equivalent resistance. That's what is um, being done here. Once I do that, I can, uh, um, see that uh, there is this four ohm resistance. Let me use something else, okay? There's a four ohm resistance. There's an 18 ohm resistance. And then there is a, an equivalent nine ohm resistance. So all of this six and three has been expressed as um, a nine ohm resistance. 
Now what I have is this 18 ohm resistance in parallel with the 9 ohm resistance. Okay, 18 ohm in parallel with the 9 ohm resistance. And I do the math for the parallel resistance in this case. Okay, the parallel resistance math is that the product R1, R2 by some R1 plus R2. Okay, so the equivalent of um, these two resistances in parallel, okay, the equivalent of this two resistances in parallel is one resistance whose value is six ohms, okay? The value of that equivalent resistance is six ohms. Now, quickly verify the sanity check. There are two resistances, 18 and nine ohms in parallel, all right? What is the equivalent resistance? Six ohm that is less than either of those, remember? Yes. So that's the that's the quick sanity check. Now, what I can do is that um, observe that the four ohm resistance is in series with the six ohm resistance. So simply add them up. Simply add the total resistance. R um, total is ten ohms. Then once I have the R total, plus minus, this is R total which is four ohm or four, 10 ohms, okay. This is 10 ohms. Our total is 10 ohms, okay. Okay, our total is 10 ohms. Now I should be able to calculate the current flowing in using Ohm's law. That's the current total current coming in. Okay, total current coming in is Ohm's law. And then um, we should be able to calculate, okay, that's the total current in coming in four ohms into the 10 ohm resistance here, which is nothing but a combination of four ohms and six ohms, okay? So the first idea was to find out IS. The first problem was to find out IS. And sure enough, I found out IS the current flowing in this um, four ohm resistance to be 12 amperes. So IS is that guy. The same current is splitting here. Or in other words, if I go back to expressing this guy using the 18 ohms and the other path, okay? So remember this guy was just a stand-in for all of this, right? The six ohms was a stand-in for 18 ohms in parallel with nine ohm resistance. So because this is six ohms and this is three ohms resistance. So um, what we can do is there are several ways we can proceed. This one way is to find V1. So what I'm going to do is to find V1 voltage here. There's more than one way to solve this problem. We'll apply a voltage V1. Uh, we'll, we'll find the vo total voltage V1 over here, which is going to be 12 amperes times. So the current flowing in here is 12 amperes and the resistance here is six ohms. So the voltage across that guy using Ohm's law is IR 72 volts, okay? So there is 72 volts over here, okay? And I can use Ohm's law again to find out the current flowing through the 18 ohm resistance, okay? So um, what I'm doing is simply repeated application of Ohm's law, okay? So I know for a fact that this voltage here is 72 volts, okay, 72 volts, because um, I found out the current in here, this V1 is 72 volts, okay, 72 volts. Okay, let's see. All right, so that gives me a value of I1 to be four amperes. I1 is four amperes and I2 to be eight amperes. I2 is 72 by, so I2, let me color code them. 
once we find the voltage 72 okay i2 is 72 divided by the total resistance in this path okay that's this guy ohm's law application of ohm's law remember the 18 ohm is in parallel with 3 and 6 similarly i1 that's the current shown in this branch is 72 volts that's the voltage across these two terminals of the green resistance 18 ohm resistance divided by the resistance ohm's law okay i simply applied ohm's law in this case okay i applied ohm's law in this case there are two paths one shown in green that's the 18 ohm resistance and the one shown in purple or pink which is the 9 ohm resistance both of them have the exact same voltage applied across them okay okay questions please So let's do, let's try to make some intuitive sense out of this okay what's the current in the resistance 18 ohm resistance four amperes what's the current in the nine ohm resistance or the purple path eight amperes okay so let me redraw this so look at this two circuits i'm going to redraw this carefully okay there is this 120 volts plus minus there is the four ohm resistance there is one path that has 18 ohms and the amount of current coming in is 12 amperes right is 12 amperes let's see 12 amperes and there is a 9 ohm resistance here. So this is the 9 ohm resistance, 3 in series with 6. Okay. So when you do the math, what you found was that this resistance current, the 12 amperes current that is coming in from west to east, okay, the 12 amperes current, well, four amperes of that is going into the 18 ohm resistance and eight amperes of that is going into the nine ohms resistance okay so what i want you to what i want you to notice is that the large resistance the 18 ohms resistance is carrying a small current the small resistance nine ohm resistance is carrying a larger current Okay, if you look at these two branches, the branch right here and the branch right here. Okay, they're in parallel. 18 ohm and 9 ohm resistance are in parallel. So the 12 ampere current is um, a large part of that is going into the smaller resistance. And a small part of that, just 4 amperes, is going into the larger resistance. Okay, so that's the notion of that's the notion of um, that's the notion of uh, current division. Okay, large resistance carries a small current. Small resistance carries a large current. Any right, questions, please? All right. So that's the notion of current and voltage division current division okay let's see if we can look at um, the idea of current division okay i have a simple resistive circuit okay i have a simple resistance circuit series resistances r1 and r2 okay are two resistances connected in series okay I know for a fact that the current going in through both of these, okay, 
the current flowing through R1 is exactly the same current that is flowing through R2. Okay, current flowing through R1 is the same as the current flowing through R2. Okay. Current flowing through R1 is the same as current flowing through R2 because they're in series, okay? But then the voltage across this guy is different. The voltage across these two are different, okay? The voltages are dropped in different ratios, okay? So the voltage V1, you can show that V1 is actually Vs by R1 plus R2 times R1. Similarly, the voltage V2, you can show that V2 is Vs by R1 plus R2 times R2. Okay, and why is that the case? Well, it's not a rocket science. This guy, Vs by R1 plus R2, that's nothing but the current flowing in. Okay, what's the current total? What's the total current flowing in this resistance? in this series resistance. Well, the total current is the total voltage that I apply by the total equivalent resistance, okay? So if you want to find the voltage that is dropped across V1, it's a simple application of Ohm's law, okay? If you apply Ohm's law, IS is uh, R1, IS times R1, but you know for a fact that IS is this guy. Okay, IS is that guy. Okay, so similarly, V2 is also, this guy is IS, IS times R2, the current flowing through the resistance times R2. All right, questions please. Okay. Okay, so this is the idea of voltage division. Okay, what's the value of V1 plus V2? If you add up V1 and V2, okay, when we put some numbers in there, it's going to make a bit more um, intuitive sense. When you add V1 and V2, it's going to be Vs over R1 plus R2 times R1. So that's V1 plus Vs by R1 plus R2 times R2. So this is V2, and the one on the left is V1. When I add up volt, both of these voltages, the value I'm going to get is R1 plus R2 over Vs, adding the numerators, because the denominators are the same. Okay, this guy is Vs. Okay, therefore, the sum of these voltages, V1 and V2, they add to a total of actually the same voltage drop, the total voltage applied. So the point here is the total voltage applied is dropped across two resistances, okay? The larger resistance has a large voltage drop, the small resistance has a small voltage drop, okay? So let me put that uh, in um, writing here large resistance. So this is this applies to series connection. Series connection. Voltage is divided. Okay, the voltage is divided and the current is constant. So you don't have to worry about okay. How is the voltage divider? divided, okay? So in series connection, large resistance drops large voltage, okay? Small resistance drops small voltage. Compare that to the parallel connection, okay? Let me do that here. Why don't I do that? I had a page here. I'm going to draw a, this guy, okay? 
in series and parallel. Okay, this is parallel series. Okay, if you remember what I mentioned was in parallel, all parallel paths have the same voltage, but the current is divided. Okay, similarly in series, the current is same. Okay, the current is same through all the resistances, through all the series resistances, but the voltage is divided. Okay, let's revisit the idea of what proportion in by how much amount. Well, what determines that is larger resistance carries, or let's, let's keep it simple, has small current. Larger resistance has small current. Remember, the smaller resistance has larger current. So this is the fundamental idea of, this is the fundamental idea of um, current division. Okay, similarly for series combination, if you remember the large resistance drops large voltage. Large resistance drops, to be more accurate, the larger resistance drops larger voltage, large voltage, and then smaller resistance drop small voltage, okay? This is the idea of voltage division in series, okay? Let me show you what I mean by that, okay? If you go back, if, if I look at this, I have a resistance, I have a um, series connection, 25 kilo ohms in series with 100 kilo ohms. And you're trying to find the current. The current is the same through both of these resistances. So there's no division about that. The voltage across this guy, V1, and the voltage across this guy, V2. Which one do you um, expect to be larger? between V1 and V2, you did not even do the math, right? So electrical engineering. V2. V2 should be larger than V1. Let's see what happens when you do the problem, okay? When you do the problem, what you will see is um, example problem, whatever happened to the solution here, okay? V0, find voltage V0. So that guy, that guy of the 100 volts that I applied, okay, 80 volts is dropped across V0 and only 20 volts is dropped across R1. So V0, 80 volts is dropped or a V0 is V2, right? I call this V0, but he called it V2, okay? Larger resistance, 100 kilo ohms resistance dropped 80%, while the smaller resistance dropped only 20%, okay? So that's the idea of voltage division. How do you find V2? So maybe I did not spend enough time on this guy, right? So I only gave you the intuitive understanding. In order to find the voltage dropped across this resistance V naught, okay? All you have to do is 
R2 by R1 plus R2 times the voltage applied. Okay, if you think about it, R2 by R1 plus R2 times the voltage applied the source. So that gives you V naught, okay, which is the same as V2. How would you find V1? V1 is resistance R1 by R1 plus R2 times Vs. So when you do the math, it's going to come out to be 20 volts. Okay, the voltage across. So that's the idea of voltage division. Okay, when you have two resistances, R1 and R2, that are connected in series through a voltage source, Vs. Okay, in this case, the voltage dropped across V1 is R1 by R1 plus R2 times Vs. And the voltage dropped across R2, okay, that's V2, is R2 by R1 plus R2 times Vs. So that's the idea of voltage division. Okay, voltage division. So let me go back and show that to you one more time. Okay. Okay, there is a resistance, two resistances in series here, V1, that's going through, that's dropped across R1, and V2, that's dropped across R2. In this case, so we, when you are evaluating V1, the numerator has R1, and the rest is Vs by R1 plus R2. Okay, the rest is the current, so the rest of the this part, this guy, that's the same, okay, in case of V1 and in case of V2 as well, okay, because that's the current. Both the resistances have the same current, okay. On the other hand, voltage V2 that's shown in purple here, okay, that's R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay, that's the idea of voltage divider. Okay, voltage divider. Questions, please. Okay, so that's the idea of voltage divider circuit. When I have resistances in series, large voltage is dropped across the larger resistance, small voltage is dropped across the smaller resistance. Okay. Let's see. And then we looked at the idea of current division as well. Okay, let's just see if we can, the current will divide resistances in parallel. So the idea of current division comes in here. Okay. I'm going to show you the equation for current division, expressions for current division. Okay. So look at this guy, a total of IS current, a total current of IS is going in, okay? And then that current is branching into I1 and I2. So if you add up I1 and I2, it should equal, that should equal IS, okay? I1, if you remember, I1 is inversely proportional to R1 in parallel, okay? So you'll see that uh, when you do the math for when you look at the equation for I1, I1 is R2 by R1 plus R2 times Is, okay? The ratio of currents here, let's be careful. Okay, similarly, I2 would be R1 over R1 plus R2 times Is. Remember voltage division, V1 was R1 by R1 plus R2. 
times V S V two was R two by R one plus R two times V S. Okay, so V one was proportional to R one. In this case, okay, when you want to calculate I one, you plug in R two. Okay, even so, when you want to calculate I two, you plug in R. Okay, so that's uh, that's the idea of current division. Current division. Okay, questions, please. Okay, so we looked at series resistances, parallel resistances. Okay, um, and then voltage division and current division. Okay, so let's see if we can put some numbers on this. That should give us a bit more intuition. Earlier, when I had resistances connected in series, okay, when I had resistances connected in series, okay, a large resistance R2 compared to 25 dropped a large voltage 80 volts. Okay, 25 dropped only 20 volts. Similarly, Let's see what happens in, in case of currents, okay? In case of currents, and then there is some formula here that you can remember, okay? R equivalent times IS, that's the voltage in parallel, and then RJ is the current. So what you want to remember is, the current in a parallel path IJ is inversely proportional to the resistance RJ. The voltage in a resistance J is directly proportional to, so I should really say inversely proportional, is directly proportional to the resistance value in series. Okay, this gives to the current division, this gives rise to the current division and voltage division formulas. Okay, let's see current division and voltage division notions. Okay. Now, so the next question is find the current in the four ohm resistance. Let's look at one example to see if we can um, solidify these concepts. Okay, let's solidify these concepts. Okay, we are supposed to find the current in the four Ohm resistance. Let's find the current in the four ohm resistance. Okay, RP on the right hand side, that is um, the first part is to notice that these two are in parallel. Okay, four and six are in parallel. Okay, four and six are in parallel. So the equivalent of four in parallel with six is four into six by that guy, four plus six, okay? So these two are in parallel, four and six um, are in parallel, okay? These two resistances are in parallel. That's four into six by four plus six. That is in series with this guy, 1.6 ohms, okay? So that's where you see the numbers. 1.6 is the one shown in purple, and the equivalent of the four and six ohm is shown in blue. And therefore it's going to come out to be a total equivalent of four ohms, okay? So this combination of 16 and four and six on the extreme right, they give rise to a resistance of four ohm, okay? that is in parallel with this. So the equivalent circuit here is 10 amperes, okay? And then 16 ohms. I'm going to replace this one, two, three, these three resistances using the equivalent resistance of four ohms, okay? Equivalent resistance of four ohms, okay? So even without doing the math, let me be a bit more uh, tidy here. So this is 16 ohms and this is four ohms, 
okay and you're asked to find ip okay you're asked to find current that is um, going into the total current that is going into these two branches okay so then um, this 10 amperes current is being divided into six 60 16 ohms and four ohms okay the 10 amperes current is divided between the 16 ohms and the 10 ohms okay so the larger resistance should see a small current and the small resistance should see a large current so sure enough when you want to find ip that's the current flowing through this branch okay that's the current flowing through this branch and this guy 16 ohms so i'm doing the color coding here just so just so it's easy for us to identify okay now so this is actually um a combination of purple and blue the parallel combination the series combination of purple and blue is shown here okay now the ip that's the current um going into the blue branch the purple and blue branch that is 16 by remember using current division there are two resistances r1 and r2 and i'm interested in finding current r2 i2 so in order to apply find current i2 or ip i have to use the other resistance opposite resistance r1 by r1 plus r2 let me go back i'll show you here okay i1 is r2 by r1 plus r2 i2 is r1 by r r1 plus r2 it's inversely proportional to the resistances okay so in order to find i2 i have to use r1 which is 16 ohms in this case does that make sense so in order to find the current through four ohm resistance i have to plug in the 16 ohms here okay questions please all right so once i have the value of um once i plug in the value of r1 r1 and r2 we get a value of eight amperes for the current okay we get a value of eight amperes for the current okay so ip that's the current flowing in here is eight amperes and this current flowing in here is two amperes the current flowing in here is two amperes The current flowing in here is two amperes. Okay, and you can verify your result um, by using a bunch of different techniques. Okay, you can look at the current that's flowing through uh, four ohm resistance. So, if you think about it, there is eight amperes of current, eight amperes of current coming in to this parallel branch through the four ohms and six ohm resistance. So this should have a larger current and this guy should have a smaller current, okay? The four ohm resistance should have a larger current and the six ohm resistance should have a, a smaller uh, percentage of the eight ohm resistance, okay? So there's a total of eight, eight amperes current coming in. A big chunk of that eight amperes should go to four ohms and a smaller chunk should go into the six ohms because the resistances, are, currents are inversely proportional to the resistance. Let's see if that is indeed the case or not, okay? The current that is flowing into the um, four ohm resistance is 4.8 amperes, okay? While the current that is flowing into the six ohm resistance, when you do the math, is 3.2 amperes. So larger resistance, has a smaller current and a smaller resistance has a larger current. When you add them up, you should get a total value of eight amperes, okay? It makes intuitive sense. It makes intuitive sense. And it's also, um, it's also in line 
with the idea of uh, current division. Okay. Questions, please. What questions do you have at this time? Okay. Okay. So this is the notion of current um, division and voltage division. So what we can do is maybe we look at a couple of example problems in the next chap next class and move on to chapter number four. So let's see what's ahead for us. Let's look at uh, let's look at uh, syllabus. Okay, if we look at the syllabus. Today is the thirteenth. The thirteenth. Oops. Thirteenth. You're supposed to look at parallel resistance, series resistances, and tomorrow we want to look at current division and voltage divisions. So what we will do is to look at some example problems in the class tomorrow, and then that way you're able to get a um, good intuition, good feel for how to solve the problems. And then um, later on, later on we'll talk about What's on 14th? Why don't I have anything scheduled for 14th? Is there a reason why there's no, um, there's no class tomorrow? We, do you know of any um, national holiday? I don't think so. So even though the syllabus does not say we are meeting tomorrow, if everybody is okay with that, I want to still have a meeting tomorrow. The schedule, uh, the schedule does not, um, show it explicitly is that okay with everybody okay yes it's okay. fine yeah, definitely. Perfect. perfect 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 so we're going to meet tomorrow okay must have been a typo for all for all the okay now the idea is that we're meeting tomorrow we look at some problems and then possibly venture into chapter four tomorrow Okay, when talking about um, chapter four and other stuff, you look at the bottom left corner, okay? There's a backing up mechanism going on. So the idea is all of these nodes actually, let's see, um, notability is available to you on Canvas. So those of you who do not already know, when you log into your Canvas, there is a link Okay, there's a link somewhere um, on Canvas that takes you to the annotated class notes. Okay, summer session two. That has all the annotated class notes, all the class notes annotated and available to you on Google Drive. Okay, similarly, let me tell, let me see if I can go to this guy. Let's see. Moodle. Moodle login. Okay. If you look at this um, at the very top, there is a Google Drive link to the class notes. You click on that, you will be taken to the class notes page. And then there's also a link to the YouTube playlist of our class recordings. So just in case any of you missed um, missed. The class, you can go back and revisit that. Okay. If you don't have further questions, okay. If you have, if you don't have further questions, I want to stop here and. Uh,